Blockbuster Video was an American-based provider of home movie and video game rental services that opened in 1985 and closed in, 2000, in 2010. If you've clicked onto this video, then you know what today is. It's Throwback Thursday. Every Thursday, I'll be releasing a new video of an old video that I did before. These new videos are longer and have more detail than the ones before. If you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button and smash that notification bell so you get notified of my latest video. Be sure to leave a comment or a suggestion for a future video. Thanks for watching. I've never seen 10,000 tapes in one store. There's so much kid stuff. And I can keep them for three evenings. Now this is a video store. Ordinary video stores don't even come close to Blockbuster Video. You've just got to see it to know what we mean. Wow. 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 What a difference. Blockbuster Video. Come discover the Blockbuster difference. Wow. The first Blockbuster store opened on October 19, 1985 in Dallas, Texas with an inventory of 8,000 VHS and 2,000 beta tapes. Cook Data Services Inc. was founded in 1982 by David Cook to supply computer software services to the Texas oil and gas industry. When the industry went bust, the company was left without a strong customer base. Cook was searching for another source of revenue when his wife Sandy, a big movie fan, suggested the video rental business. Looking into the industry, Cook learned that the video rental field was highly fragmented. Most stores were relatively modest family operations that carried a very small selection of former big hit titles. Providing a large selection of movies required a large investment of capital since distributors typically charged approximately $70 per tape. In addition, tapes were generally not displayed but kept behind the counter to discourage theft and had to be fetched and laboriously signed out before the customer could leave. Cook saw that operations could be greatly streamlined by a computerized system for inventory control and checkout, something his software background had prepared him to develop. David Cook sold his oil and gas software business to its managers and entered the movie rental business in October of 1985. Cook opened the first blockbuster video outlet in Dallas. Using the profit he made from the sale of David P. Cook & Associates, the subsidiary of his company, he decided to buy into a video store franchise in Dallas known as Video Works. When Video Works would not allow him to decorate the interior of his store with a blue and yellow design, he departed the franchise. With 8,000 tapes covering 6,500 titles, it had an inventory many times larger than its nearest competitor. In addition, tapes were displayed on shelves throughout the store like a bookstore so that customers could pick them up and carry them to the front desk for checkout. A magnetic strip on each video and sensors at the door discouraged theft. Computers were used to keep track of inventory and a laser scanning system which used barcodes on the tapes and on the members' cards simplified and reduced the time involved in conducting transactions. The first Blockbuster store was an immediate hit. The Cooks discovered that the public had a much greater appetite for renting video movies than they had previously suspected. People were interested not just in seeing hit movies they had missed in the theaters, but also in a broad variety of other features. By the summer of 1986, Cook had expanded the Blockbuster concept to three additional stores. To reflect the different nature of the company, Cook Data Services became Blockbuster Entertainment Corporation in June of 1986. In February of 1987, Cook sold a third of Blockbuster to a group of three investors. 
John Milk, Donald Flynn, and Wayne Huizinga were all former associates of Waste Management Inc., and they had invested $18.6 million in Blockbuster stock. With this move, Cook surrendered future control of Blockbuster, and Huizinga became the dominant voice in the determining the company's future. While Cook had envisioned growth through franchising, selling Blockbuster's name and computer system to individual entrepreneurs, Huizinga foresaw growth through company ownership of stores. By June of 1987, Blockbuster owned 15 stores and had franchised 20 others. With this base, Huizinga set out to transform Blockbuster into the industry's dominant player. He kept most of Cook's policies, such as store hours from 10 a.m. to midnight every day, a three-day rental policy, which encouraged customers to rent more than one tape at once, and a broad selection of titles. Despite conventional wisdom that the videotape rental business was heavily dependent on hits, 70% of Blockbuster's rental revenues came from non-hit movies which had the added benefit of being less expensive to purchase from distributors. In addition, Blockbuster's management decided to askew revenue from X-rated adult films, opting instead for a family-friendly environment. In 1990, Blockbuster bought mid-Atlantic rival Errols, which had more than 250 stores. In 1992, Blockbuster acquired the Sound Warehouse and Music Plus music retail chains and created Blockbuster Music. In October of 1993, Blockbuster took a controlling interest in Spelling Entertainment Group, a media company run by television producer Aaron Spelling. Blockbuster also purchased Super Club Retail Entertainment Corporation in 1993 from Philips Electronics. This brought approximately 270 record bar, tracks, turtles, and rhythms, and view music stores and approximately 160 video retail superstores. It also owned 35% of Republic Pictures. That company merged with Spelling in April of 1994. Viacom acquired Blockbuster in 1994 for $8.4 billion to help finance its bid for Paramount in the bidding war with QVC Network. By 1997, Blockbuster was floundering. New releases weren't making it to the stores by their street date, and the loss of so many key people with the company's moves left it stumbling in basic store operations. As a result, the chain scaled back on expansion and moved to refocus on its core business, video rentals. In late 1997, it exited the computer business. The company revived its old tagline, Make It a Blockbuster Night, and sought to smooth out the problems with its state-of-the-art distribution system, which allowed it to use a customer database to determine store sites and inventory based on consumer preferences. Blockbuster still controlled 25% of the $16 billion a year home video market. The company signed a revenue sharing agreement with the major Hollywood studios, making them financial partners. Now instead of paying $65 for new tapes, Blockbuster paid $4 and turned over 30 to 40% of the rental income to the studios. In 1998, the company boasted that it had served nearly 60 million people who rented more than 970 million movies and video games. In late 1998, Blockbuster launched a loyalty program called Blockbuster Rewards that allowed customers to earn free rentals, including one older title each month from the category of Blockbuster Favorites. After the 1998 test launch, the chain went nationwide with the program in 1999. That same year, Viacom sold the Blockbuster music chain to Warehouse Entertainment, which was subsequently purchased by Trans World Entertainment in 1993. 
In mid-2000, the company partnered with Enron in an attempt to create a video-on-demand service. The agreement was supposed to last for 20 years, however. Enron terminated the deal in March of 2001 over fears that Blockbuster would not be able to provide sufficient films for the service. And also in 2000, Blockbuster turned down a chance to purchase the fledgling Netflix for $50 million. On October 14, 2004, Blockbuster was spun off from Viacom. At the time, the store chain had over 9,000 stores worldwide. Blockbuster also rolled out its Game Rush store-in-store -store concept to approximately 450 domestic company-operated stores. Blockbuster began game and DVD trading in selected U.S. stores as well. In 2005, Blockbuster began a campaign promoting its No More Late Fees policy. The campaign proved controversial with the Associated Press reporting that the new policy actually charged customers the full price of the movie or game after 8 days which they would cancel by returning the product in question and paying a fee. More than 40 states filed suits against the company for false advertising. Blockbuster later settled the suit by agreeing to refunds as well as promising to better explain the policy. A billion dollar campaign called Total Access was introduced in 2007 as a strategy against Netflix. Through Blockbuster Online, customers could rent a DVD online and receive a new movie for free when they returned it to the Blockbuster store. While it was a major success, every free movie cost the company $2, but the hope was that it would attract enough new subscribers to cover the loss. Blockbuster acquired MovieLink for $6.6 .6 million, focusing a shift to streaming video. MovieLink was an online video service that allowed customers to download movie rentals from a library of over 6,000 films created in 2002 by five major studios including Warner Brothers, MGM Studios, Paramount Pictures, Sony Pictures, and Universal Studios. The move gave Blockbuster the opportunity to move away from the unprofitable Total Access, which was DVD by mail, service in favor of online streaming. Despite growing competition from Netflix and Redbox, the company mistakenly downplayed the threat. They chose instead to focus on Apple and Walmart as their primary competition. Blockbuster had already begun its downward spiral at this point. From 2003 to 2005, Blockbuster lost 75% of its market value. At the beginning of 2010, Blockbuster had over 6,500 stores, of which 4,000 were in the United States, a number that fell to 3,400 in late October the same year. In the United States, it planned to close between 810 to 960 retail stores and instead launch as many as 10,000 Blockbuster Express video rental kiosks by the middle of 2010. It had been claimed that more than 43 million U.S. households had Blockbuster memberships. On September 23, 2010, Blockbuster filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Due to challenging losses, $900 million in debt, and strong competition from Netflix, Redbox, and Video On Demand services, apparently not from Apple or Walmart. Dish Network eventually won the auction on April 6, 2011, agreeing to buy Blockbuster for $320 million and the assumption of $87 million in liabilities and other obligations. It was also announced that Dish would keep only 500 Blockbuster stores open. The acquisition was completed on April 26, 2011. Between November 6, 2013 and January 12, 2014, all 300 remaining corporate-owned Blockbuster stores in the United States were closed and the DVD-by-mail program was shut down. 
Although Blockbuster stores could remain open by paying a licensing fee to Dish, there was no longer a corporate entity to provide supplies of branded products, forcing franchisees to design and produce their own. Additional store closures would continue. By January of 2018, the company's website listed nine remaining franchise-owned stores in the United States, including six in Alaska, two in Oregon, and one in Texas. Eight of those nine had closed by August of 2018, leaving only one store in Bend, Oregon. Your local blockbuster. You might remember those days, right? Well, tonight, people in one town are keeping that tradition alive. By next week, this blockbuster in Bend, Oregon will be the only one left. The other two stores in Alaska are closing this weekend. Tourists and loyal customers are now flocking to the store in Bend for a little taste of nostalgia. The last location is located in Bend, Oregon, and it is still open to this day. It was also featured in a documentary as well. So what are some of your favorite memories of this place? Leave a comment or a suggestion for a future video below. Be sure to hit that like button. Thanks for watching.